Joseph Ronka is uh, going to introduce Representative McGovern with just a few short words. And I just want to say something about Joe Ronka. He is a professor of social sciences at Springfield College. He is the originator and host of the program that I mentioned on Amherst Community Television, Creating a Human Rights Culture. And he is the international representative to the United Nations in Geneva for teachers, scholars, and practitioners in the social sciences worldwide. So, I am finished. <laughs> Joe. Hi everyone, well thanks Martha for the generous introduction and I'm always in awe of your commitment and organization skills. Thanks for organizing this. Hi, Thank you, McGovern. Well it is with much pleasure that I have this opportunity to introduce United States Representative James McGovern, Democrat from Massachusetts Congregational District 2, whose offices are in Northampton. He has a long-standing, if not flawless, record on human rights, who, among other things, was the lead investigator into the eight murders in El Salvador of American priests, their housekeeper and daughter, who also committed other atrocities. And because of his investigation, it implicated the Salvadorian military, which led the United States to give aid conditioned on their approved human rights record. Considered one of the most liberal members of Congress, he has also, one, stated forthrightly that health care is a human right. Two, introduced a People's Rights Amendment in opposition to the Supreme Court's decision of Citizens United limiting constitutional rights to persons, not corporations. Three, he has opposed companies being given leases to mines, adjacent water supplies. Four, he has supported measures to cut climate disaster and to reverse temperature rises. And five, he has expanded food, education, and child nutrition programs here and in poorer countries. That's just a few. Um, I invite you to Google him. I could be here for three more hours, doing great. He is also a person of courage. He was arrested at one time for protests in front of the Sudanese embassy to condemn abuses in its Darfur region. So I'll tell you, he's more than just talking papers. He actually does it, which is what this is about. And presently, he is co-chair of the well-known and rather effective Thomas Lantos Human Rights Commission, where the words, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, are noticeably imprinted. And it is this document whose endorsement without dissent by the United Nations General Assembly on December 10, 1948, we celebrate today. So here is U.S. Representative James McGovern. Well, first of all, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, let, me, let me thank Joe for those very kind words. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate them. Thank you. Um, and it is my privilege uh, and my pleasure to join you all today uh, on International Human Rights Day to commemorate the 69th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I want to thank uh, Amherst Chapter 128 of Amnesty International and Arthur Spiegelman and Fanny Rothschild in particular for inviting me to participate today and for the great work that all of you do to promote and protect human rights uh, not only all around the world but here in our own country. Uh, and I very much value your concern, your involvement, and your commitment and um, at a time when uh, there's a lot of bad news going on, I have to tell you, coming here to Amherst uh, this afternoon on this Sunday, uh, it gives me great hope to see this room packed with people uh, because that shows uh, that, that you care. And I think uh, we need people who care to stand up and have their voices be heard on human rights and on so many other issues. You know, I like uh, 
Human Rights Day because every year it gives us an opportunity to step back and take stock of where things stand with human rights here at home and around the world. Uh, you know, this past uh, week, I joined His Excellency Zaid Rad Al Hussein, who's the U UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, at an event in Congress that uh, was organized by the Tom Landers Human Rights Commis Commission, which I co chair. The High Commissioner uh, reminded us, and we had a packed room there as well, uh, but he reminded us of a very important point, and that is that human rights is always a struggle, una lucha to use a strong, symbolic Spanish word. The defense of human rights requires patience and fortitude. Human rights gains are never handed to us. There is always opposition, and we always have to fight to overcome it. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is, after all, an aspirational document. It is not a treaty. It is not binding. It lays out basic principles of rights and freedoms that are meant to serve, in the words of the Declaration itself, and I quote, as a common standard of achievement for all peoples of all nations, end quote. You know, one of the things I admire most about the Universal Declaration is that it defines and declares one body of rights, individual, political, economic, social, and cultural, all bound together in a single vision. Its approval was a threshold event. It was the beginning of concerted efforts all around the world to place human dignity at the center of affairs of state. So how are we doing 69 years later? Well, clearly, there's a lot of bad news. Um, in Burma, since last August, more than 620,000 Rohingya have been forced to flee for their lives to escape a brutal military campaign characterized by very critical, cre credible observers as ethnic cleansing, e ethnic cleansing and potentially genocide. Eyewitnesses have described civilians being hacked to death and burned alive. Women and girls have been gang raped. Men, women, and children have had their throats slit. Villages have been burned to the ground and crops have been destroyed. It is bitterly disillusioning that these barbarous retrograde acts have been committed on the watch of a government led by Aung San Suu Kyi, a Nobel Prize laureate, and until now a human rights icon. Then there is Syria, one of the greatest human rights debacles since World War II. Since the armed conflict in Syria began with nonviolent protests in March 2011, between 250,000 and 470,000 people have died, including tens of thousands of civilians and millions of people who have been displaced within and outside their country's borders. The government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has systematically attacked medical facilities and first responders. It has used chemical weapons on its own population. Those are war crimes. And forced disappearance committed by the Assad government is so widespread that in 2013, the UN Commission of Inquiry determined that it could amount to a crime against humanity. There is Yemen, where the International Committee of the Red Cross has gone on social media to shout to the world that there is no clean water, medicines are running out, people are starving, and famine looms, all because the Saudi-led coalition that is waging war with U.S. support has, refu has refused to allow in humanitarian aid. And then there is the genocide committed against the Yazidi people by the Islamic State, where um, rape was weaponized. The full scales of, that of those atrocities uh, against the Yazidis are, are remain unknown. We could look at uh, all of these situations and say, well, these are armed conflicts. Of course there will be lots of killing, and of course local people will suffer. Uh, first, uh, let me just say that's not the way it's supposed to be. According to the Geneva Conventions, wars should be conducted in ways that protect civilians, not target them. The disregard of international humanitarian law in today's armed, co armed conflicts is a huge, step, a huge step backwards from a human rights perspective. And that's before we get to the issue of mistreatment of refugees and the displaced. But sadly, the grave human rights crises around the world are not limited to situations of armed conflict. In China, the government seems hell-bent on crushing the distinctive religious, cultural, and linguistic identity of Tibetans. And I want to thank the Tibetan community for giving me this prayer show here today. 
You know, I constantly receive reports from Tibet of human rights abuses, like the demolition of buildings and forced eviction of religious people from the famous Buddhist Institute at Larangar, like the restrictions that keep Tibetans from traveling around their own country, much less abroad, like the hundreds of Tibetan prisoners of conscience, many of whom are monks and some of whom, like Tenzin Delic Rinpoche, have died in custody. You know, one of, the, one of those prisoners of conscience is the 11th Pancha Lama, the second highest leader in the Tibetan religion. He was detained by Chinese authorities when he was six years old. That was 22 years ago. Or like His Holiness the Dalai Lama himself, an 82-year-old man of peace who has lived in exile for decades. According to the Universal Declaration, he has the right to return home for a visit or to live, but that right is denied to him. Something similar is happening to the Uyghurs, a largely Muslim ethnic group that lives in northwestern China. Like the Tibetans, the Uyghurs are victims of restrictions imposed by the Chinese authorities on their religious, cultural, and linguistic practices, a systematic effort to undermine and erase their identity. I am sorry to say that I could describe many, many, many more situations of human rights abuses that people have brought to my attention. The tens of thousands of citizens, journalists, civil society, and opposition leaders imprisoned by the corrupt authoritarian leaders in countries like Turkey, Egypt, and Azerbaijan. Brave democracy acti activists like Raif Badawi in Saudi Arabia uh, and Nabil Rajab in Bahrain, unjustly imprisoned for blogging or telling the truth about injustices in their societies. Horrendous extrajudicial killings carried out in service of, infamous, of, of, of an infamous war against drugs in the Philippines. The unpunished murder of journalists and bloggers in places as different as Mexico and Bangladesh and so on and so on and so on. And we can talk about many of the others uh, here today, um, you know, after my opening remarks. But I, I say all this because and things around the world, um, from a human rights perspective, uh, are, are pretty dire. They're not looking that good. And then there is our own country. You know, oftentimes we, we talk about human rights as if it only applies to people halfway around the world. Well, we are signatories to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as well. So how are, how are we doing here in the United States on human rights? Well, to be quite frank, we're not perfect. Um, and uh, we must do much better when it comes to human rights. We have a long history of cozying up to brutal regimes abroad with massive arms sales that help them stay in power. We have 2.2 million people incarcerated in this country. With 5% of the world's population, we have 21% of the prisoners. Our African American brothers and sisters are incarcerated at five times the rate of white citizens. We are the only Western industrialized country that still uses the death penalty. In 2016, the U.S. shamefully ranked seventh in the world in documented executions behind such human rights luminaries as China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Pakistan, and Egypt. 13% of American citizens are black, but they account for 34% of those put to death. We know structural racism plays a role in that injustice. There we have 42 million people living here in the United States who are food insecure, living with hunger, or on the risk of hunger every day. In the United States of America, the richest country in the history of the world, it is a disgrace that any child goes to bed hungry, that any senior citizen has to choose between life-saving medication and a decent meal, that any veteran who risks his or her life in defense of our nation doesn't have enough to eat, that any individual suffers from hunger. Food is a fundamental human right, yet I have to fight every single year in the Congress to keep my colleagues from gutting investments in federally funded programs, programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program known as SNAP, the Special Supplemental Program for Women, Infants, and Children known as WIC, and school meals uh, you know, uh, that have been proven to help alleviate hunger in this country. And yet every year it's a battle to just fight these to make sure that these programs are funded at current levels. It is true, it, it, in a truly rights-respecting country, we would not still be having this debate. 
You know, what is also new and concerns me deeply is that today, in 2017, many attacks on human rights are coming directly from the President of the United States. It is the President of the United States who, on a daily basis, diminishes the hard work of fact-finding journalists, the canaries in the coal mine of freedom of expression, practically inciting violence against them. It is the President of the United States who cannot distinguish uh, peaceful protesters exercising their right to dissent from thuggish proponents of violence in service of their racial bigotry. It is the President of the United States who denigrates immigrants and seeks to prohibit the entry into the United States of populations of entire countries. It is the President of the United States who seeks to deport anyone who arrived here by irregular means, regardless of their circumstances, and regardless of the risk that they may face in their country of origin, ripping apart families in the process. And it's the President of the United States who recklessly risks a nuclear confrontation with North Korea that endangers every single person on this planet. It is the President of the United States who cuts back on public lands, the birthright of every American, who rolls back regulations meant to protect our water and our health, and who looks for ways to prevent American citizens from exercising their right to vote. Those are all part of the, fundamental, uh, 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 the, the fundamentals of the Declaration of Human Rights. Environmental protection is a big part of it. Those poor people uh, living in Flint, Michigan, who had a drink lead contaminated water. That is a violation of your fundamental human rights. And by the way, that is not unique uh, in this country. The president attacks on human rights in the United States are the flip side of the coin of his irresponsible decision to abandon human rights leadership abroad. I mean, we have seen the shameful spectacle of his embrace of the worst of the world's dictators and despots, Vladimir Putin, Rodrigo Duterte, who we invited to a state dinner at the White House, Xi Jinping, Erdogan of, of Turkey. You know, we have seen, uh, we have seen this, um, this lack of leadership as when he meets with these leaders and others around the world that he is silent uh, at the abuses against women, at the abuses against the LBGTQ community. Silence when people are routinely rounded up for being who they are, for trying to live a life with dignity. So yes, we are in a difficult moment for human rights. So what now? Well, you got to keep going. We got to keep struggling. We got to keep fighting. And perhaps someday we will reach the point where we can relax a little bit. Where we won't have to defend human rights every single moment of every single day. But that is not where we are now. Today we must renew our commitment to human rights and act on behalf half of it every day. What we do each and every what we do, each and every one of us, can and, and does make a difference. I will argue that this gathering here today makes a difference. It sends this ripple that will be well, they get they can spread. Um, it, it shows that there are, this is a community that cares. But let me give you a couple of examples. You know, as was mentioned by Joe in, in his opening, I get my start in human rights uh, during the Civil War in El Salvador in the 1980s. Uh, fighting to protect refugees from El Salvador and Central America, and later by investigating the brutal assassination of six Jesuit priests, their housekeeper, and her daughter uh, at the University of Central America in San Salvador at the request of my former boss and mentor, Congressman Joe Mokley of Boston. The peace accord that ended the Civil War was signed 25 years ago in El Salvador. Yet there are still gaping wounds caused by the horrific human rights violations that were committed by the Salvadoran state. Abuses that the United States facilitated by siding with the Salvadoran armed forces, by training them, and by supplying them with weapons made here in the United States. You know, I remember when we were investigating the murder of the Jesuits, one of the shocking things that I learned was that uh, 19 of the 24 trigger men that actually went onto the campus and shot these priests, their housekeeper and their daughter in cold blood, 19 of them were trained at the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. They received U.S. training. Um, and yet, this is what they did. Um, ever since that war ended, I have continued to fight for justice for its victims because that's the only way you get to achieve true peace and reconciliation. You know, I, 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 I am always intrigued when I hear 
people, uh, members of the uh, military in El Salvador today or in other countries that have had brutal uh, past, when they say, well, you know what, the past is the past, let's just forget about it and move on to the future. Well, you can't do that. Because, you know, when you murder somebody, when you disappear somebody, that somebody is part of somebody's family. Those families don't get, don't get over that. They want to know what happened. Not everybody needs to go to jail, but the truth has to be known. There needs to be an accounting. And I think in the United States, especially with regard to countries like El Salvador, we have a special obligation, given how involved we were uh, in that war. Uh, you know, you can't change the past, but we can all help shape the future. In the last couple of months, a little bit of good news, I've seen some progress in El Salvador. In September, the Salvador government, um, in, a, in, in small part at my urging, along with this organization called the Mauricio Aquino Foundation, but the Salvador government agreed to create a new commission to search for the remains of men and women who were forcibly disappeared by the state during that war. Um, you know, over the years, um, when I would come to meetings, including here in Massachusetts, uh, I would bump into members of the Salvadoran community, many of them who came here in the 1980s. They came here because somebody in their family, their mother, their father, their sister or brother, were disappeared. But they never knew what happened. Um, and they want to know what happened. I have met with, uh, I met with a woman um, whose husband was disappeared in 1988. Um, and she still thinks he must be alive somewhere. But there's been no closure. Um, and what we want the government down there to do is help bring closure, help people find their loved ones, the bones of their loved ones, so they can actually bury them um, with dignity and get some closure in their life and be able to move on with their life. Um, but this commission should finally make it possible to find and bury the bones of mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and, and sons and daughters who were tortured and killed for trying to make their country a better place. It is important that they get this right. If you can't get that right, you're never going to deal with the issues of impunity. You're never going to deal uh, with um, any of these other human rights cases. On November 29th of this year, former Salvadoran Colonel Orlando Montano, who was actually hiding here in Massachusetts uh, near Boston, for several years, um, a uh, high-ranking member of the Salvadoran Armed Forces and much, very much involved in the execution of the murder of the Jesuit priest, he was arrested because he lied about his immigration uh, st uh, status and why he was here, um, and he's being extradited to Spain to stand trial for the 1989 murders of those Jesuit priests, which is a signal to I hope human rights violators all over, over the world that, you know what, the day of reckoning will come. You can't just brush this aside. And this last weekend, I was in El Salvador. I had the great privilege of traveling to El Mazote, where a thousand people were killed in cold blood by those U.S.-backed Salvadoran soldiers with their made in American, made in American guns in 1981. And you may remember this, uh, but in 1981, when this killing happened, a, few, a couple of brave reporters actually documented it. And our government at the time, uh, the Reagan administration, and our U.S. ambassador in El Salvador said it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. That it was manufactured uh, left-wing propaganda by the FMLN or by groups <clears throat> that were sympathetic. But it never happened. In 1993, when the, after the war was over with, a forensics team from Argentina came and began excavating um, and recovering the bodies. And, um, and we went there uh, over the weekend. I took my 16-year-old daughter with me, uh, and we stood at an area that is probably maybe just twice the size of, of what this kind of uh, uh, tablecloth is here. Um, and apparently, in that small area, the Salvadoran Atlacat Battalion, who we helped form and we trained, in that one little area rounded up 146 children um, as young as one month old and shot them uh, and burned them and then covered them up in a shallow grave. And for my daughter, who was 16 years old, to see how many 16-year-olds were there uh, was a moment of disbelief for her. How could any human being do this to kids? But in all told, in this village, over a thousand people were killed. Now, in the, in the aftermath of the Salvadoran War, they had an amnesty, and so everything was closed. 
The, the Supreme Court in El Salvador has said that is no longer going to be the case. They revoked the amnesty, and this case has been reopened up. Um, and we need to help the prosecutors and the investigators get the information they need to be able to hold those people to account. But some things are hard to change, and that this whole concept of impunity. The Salvador Minister of Defense said we have no records of who was in charge of anything back in 1981, which is hard to believe. But you know what? We do, because we train these people, and we arm these people, and it is up to us, again, given our terrible involvement in this crime uh, back in 1981, to help them um, to help them get to the truth. And the other thing in El Salvador was good is that the Salvador Attorney General's office has called for the reopening of the Jesuit case, so that we might be able to get justice in that case as well. But it's been many years, but there is hope for progress on justice in El Salvador, and we need to be the wind at those kind of efforts, whether they're in El Salvador or any other country or in our country, uh, to help you know cheer on those forces demanding justice and accountability. Just one more example. At the end of November, I and, I and some of you here helped participate in the 8th Annual Monty's March, which is led by WRSI, the River's morning host, Monty Belmonte, which is a 43-mile walk from Springfield to Greenfield uh, to raise awareness about hunger in our community and to raise money for the Western Mass Food Bank. As I said, we don't have a city or town in Massachusetts or in the United States that's hunger-free. This is a big issue. But this time around, they raised over $250,000, which is a record that would help a lot of struggling families here in Massachusetts. But just to give you a clue, that translates into 708,000 meals for families uh, in this community uh, that will go directly to individuals and families struggling with food insecurity. Now, Monty's March is not a substitute for strong governmental action to ensure the right to food, but it's an important contribution, and it helps raise awareness each in every year in our communities about this hidden uh, suffering. And during that march, uh, we also made a short stop at the First Congregational Church of Amherst to visit Lucio Perez, uh, who many of you will again see later this afternoon, who's being given sanctuary to show our solidarity uh, and to protest the Trump administration's immigration laws that rip families apart. That's a powerful uh, initiative in this community to say that we're going to provide a circle of protection to good people, that we're going to stand up to our own government. I know it's not easy, and with the Attorney General Jeff Sessions threatening all kinds of actions and with you know all the kind of negative stuff that you might be directed at you in social media, it is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do, and people should be proud of the fact that this community came together and stood up against the wind and said, you know what, we are human beings. We are all are human beings. We need to respect uh, each other. We need to make sure we protect one another. Uh, and we don't believe that it is appropriate to rip families apart, uh, because that is not who we are. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt once said that the Universal Declaration of uh, the Uni that, that Eleanor Roosevelt once said that universal human rights begin, and let me quote, in small places, close to home so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world uh, of the individual person, the neighborhood he or she lives in, the school or college he or she attends, the factory, farm, or office where he or she works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity, without discrimination. And unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerned citizens' action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world." End quote. So that's the message I, I leave with you today. Um, we each, every one of us, we're the future of human rights. I mean, we have power. Um, we have to use it. We have to demand that our country and the rest of the world uphold a higher standard of human rights. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. We each make a difference. This, this, this gathering here makes a difference. The sanctuary of Lucio Perez makes a difference. Monty's March makes a difference. I mean, uh, all these things make a difference. We are more than the resistance. We are the agents of the change we seek. And it is through us that the moral authority of the United States will be restored at home and abroad. And again, I thank you for 
inviting me here today, and I thank you for your continued concern. Thank you. Thank you so much for so moving. My family is from El Salvador. Um, my name is Maria Cuerda, and um, I work with the Pina Valley Workers Center. I'm here with Andrea Schmidt, whose family is from Honduras. So, uh, and we're just going to quickly, Andrea's going to read a quick statement by Lucio Perez. Uh, we just wanted to thank um, the organizers of this event for allowing us to bring a message from Lucio Perez to you all. Uh, about his situation. Um, can we just get a quick show of hands? Are people aware of Lucio's situation? Wow, okay. So Lucio's from Guatemala. Uh, he's been in the U.S. about 20 years. And, um, you know, one of the reasons he is here and one of the reasons that many, many undocumented people are in Massachusetts and all over the country, obviously, is because they are fleeing human rights situations as well as extreme poverty um, situations that our government has had a role in. Um, I wanted to, there's also some uh, materials in the back. There's a sign-up sheet if you'd like to become involved. There are um, a lot of people who are involved in assisting Lucio and assisting uh, what is happening with undocumented people in the valley. Um, so there's stuff back there. I hope you'll check it out if you're interested. Um, I did want to make a quick correction that our event is unfortunately going to start at 3.30. So we're just going to walk uh, down the street um, to the back of the church and have a quick, uh, about a half hour event uh, with Lucio to highlight his situation. Um, so I think that's it. And uh, Andrea is going to read what Lucio has to say to all of you today. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank God and each one of you who are supporting me in this difficult time. My situation is very difficult. It is very hard being apart from my family and my community. We need to keep fighting because the only way we win is if we unite. Even though I'm away from my children, I would never wish this on anyone. I hope we will all work together and working together find the strength to keep fighting. I am not a criminal, and immigrants are not criminals like some people say. We deserve the right to live with our families. We risked our lives and had to leave our families to come here without knowing what we would find. We are being unfairly persecuted here, and we ask you for your help so that we can we can come out of this we can come out of the shadows. Thank you again to each one of you, and God bless you. I'd like to recognize Nancy Duanian. You just came from the torture conference. Now, would you like to say a few words? Oh, okay. Can you hear me? All right. Well, Nancy Duanian just came from a torture conference. Right. Hi, I'm Nancy from uh, No More Guantanamos. And I actually have a question for um, our representative, McGovern. Um, my question relates to the U.S.'s use of torture, and that's coming out of this, uh, this conference that I attended. Uh, last week um, in North Carolina. It was the North Carolina Commission of Inquiry on Torture. Um, the commission was a culmination of work by North Carolina citizens who discovered in 2005 that a CIA front company called Aero Contractors was operating rendition flights, torture taxis, um, out of their local airport and carrying people, um, victims from their homes, to CIA black sites around the world, and to Guantanamo prison, and to countries um, known to use torture on behalf of the CIA. In two days of testimony, we heard from torture victims, military interrogators, attorneys, and many others who reported on torture and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment uh, by the CIA and U.S. personnel. Um, in violation of U.S. and international law. And I did bring some orange literature in the back that lists uh, what the commissioners were talking about and the website where you can watch the testimony that was given over the two days. Um, the next step is to compile the commission's findings into a report. And so my question for you is, um, do you have any suggestions for using that report 
to help us reach the goal of ending U.S. Uh, use of torture and to holding um, the planners and those responsible accountable. Thank you. Well, I, I think that torture is again. I mean, I, torture is a violation of international law. I think any. I think it's a violation against our own laws. I think that uh, the torture that. Uh, that, that went on, um, whether it be at Abu Ghraib or at Guantanamo or any or, or this whole policy of rendition was illegal, um, and I think that the people in the Bush Justice, Justice Department who provided the cover to allow the torturers to think that they could get away with it, I think violated the law. I wish that in the aftermath, when, I, I, I had hoped that when President Obama had become elected president, we would have held hearings and gone back and actually kind of clarified the record. Um, and um, but I think these reports are important um, because um, it, it, it provides members of Congress um, and human rights organizations kind of the you know the, the research and the data to be able to make the case um, to, uh, to the administration why this is unacceptable and why we hope it's not happening. Um, you know this is a, this is a violation of law, and I hope it is used um, as as a tool to lobby members of Congress. We are happy to work with them to try to get it circulated, if that, if that is helpful. Um, but, you know, one of the things I'm going to say, whether it's torture or a lot of these other human rights issues, you know, part of the challenge right now um, in Washington is that um, there's just so much happening. You know, it's, I mean, between tweets and erratic behavior and, you know, crazy elections and, I mean, it has sucked the oxygen out of the room in a way that it's hard to focus on one issue for more than two seconds. And we have to be disciplined. I, I, I'm really, I, you know, I mentioned that I, I co-chair the uh, Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. I, I've lost count of how many human rights defenders around the world who have put their lives on the line in countries all over the world who are wondering whether we care anymore. Um, I mean, they can't even get from our government an expression of concern when they are arrested unjustly and when they're subjected to torture. We can't get a protest. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the president went over on his trip and met with the Chinese leader and didn't mention anything about human rights. Didn't mention anything to the Saudis about human rights. Um, and for all this talk about trying to bring peace to the Middle East, you know, his announcement on Jerusalem was like throwing gasoline, you know, on a fire. I mean, so um, so I would just say that I think what we need to do is we need to be more disciplined and we need to just continue to push, 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 push. And, um, you know, Amnesty has been great, um, you know, uh, we work with them in the, in the commission, uh, but we need, we need more lobby days, we need more people in, their, in, in individual states who want to see their representatives, and we need good, credible information like this report that you are going to you will provide us and we will help circulate that and make sure it gets a wide audience. Do we have um, any questions or comments? Yeah, we have some time. Sure. Okay, so go ahead. There's a handheld mic on yeah. the yeah. air. Yeah, here's the mic. You can turn it on. Is it hello? No? <laughs> I don't know how to. I'm a congressman, I'm not to turn the mic on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, would you please speak um, about the plight of the United States' original inhabitants, the Native Americans? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I'll, give, I'll give you this here. Yeah, we have not, uh, we have not been kind over the years to the original inhabitants of, of this this land that we have, and we have now moved into, uh, our Native Americans and. Um, and uh, it, and most and, and you know I, I talked about issues of food insecurity and you know healthcare challenges and everything else, and a lot of other issues that I think are all uh, environmental protection all part of kind of a, our human rights approach that tend to be um, you know uh, worse um, on Native American reservations uh, and um, and I. Uh, you know, we, we, we just re recently debated a, a bill in Congress that, again, would, fr you know, that would further encroach on Native American lands for mining and for, you know, for other kind of minerals exp exploration without any consultation with the, the, uh, the 
people who live there, um, who, whose, whose land is part of their, their heritage. Um, and um, so it, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, a record that we all can be proud of. Um, and, um, and again, it's, you, uh, you, it's hard, you can't change the past. The question is how do we do this so we can help shape the future uh, so that some of these injustices, um, they don't get erased, they don't get mitigated, but maybe that we can you know, try to overcorrect in another way. Um, as we move forward to the future, but um, but I, you know, I mean, we are we all should be deeply troubled by our history with uh, the Native American population, um, and by the, uh, quite frankly, the the, the 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 bad treatment that I still I still think they get, um, you know. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, if you have suggestions of concrete initiatives that we can take, I'm I'm happy to work with you. When you, um, when Bill Browder came to you and um, asked you to help sponsor the, what became the Magnitsky Act, Sorry. did you have any idea it would develop into what it has with Trump? No. So the, the, let me give you, for those of you who don't know about what the Magnitsky Act is, I'm the House author of the Magnitsky Act. It basically, um, Sergei Magnitsky um, was a Russian citizen um, who was an accountant. Uh, and um, he was working for a, a company uh, and uh, in the course of his work uncovered massive corruption, some of the worst corruption in Russian history. And being a good citizen, he thought the right thing to do would be to report it to the authorities, which he did, uh, but unfortunately the people that were benefiting from the corruption were really close friends of Vladimir Putin. So Sergei Magnitsky, uh, a father, you know, a son, you know, uh, an accountant uh, was put in jail. Uh, and he was tortured and ultimately killed. Uh, and, um, and so the man he worked for was this guy Bill Browder, who um, uh, is now is a British citizen now, but um, his grandfather was the, ran for president heading up the Communist Party here in the United States. Uh, many years ago, um, but was so upset by this that he did, he he wanted he didn't want to let it go. He he, he thought that there should be some accountability, and so we had done a hearing in um, in the Atlanta Human Rights Commission uh, on human rights in Russia, and he was one of the people that testified, um, and he told Sergei Magnitsky's story, and basically said that you know nobody will take this thing up. And so what I su suggested was that, you know, well, why don't we work on some legislation here? Um, and, we and, and we would work on legislation, would name it after Sergei Magnitsky, but the legislation would essentially say that, um, you know, even if, even if there's no justice in a particular country, um, you know, many of these people, especially those involved in corruption, are, are raking in millions and millions and billions of dollars, right? They hide their money in U.S. banks. They come to the United States and go to Disney World. They travel freely. Well, why don't we just say this? You know, um, if after a thorough investigation by state and, and treasury, we find that these people are guilty of corruption or severe human rights violations, then they will be banned from coming to the United States and they can't hide their money in U.S. banks. Mm -hmm. And if their money is in U.S. banks or they're buying up U.S. property, their assets will be frozen. Mm -hmm. There will be a consequence. Mm -hmm. And we passed it in the House and in the Senate. And it became law. Originally, it was supposed to be global. Uh, in its reach, but uh, there was a cost issue, so it, be, for, it, was, it first began as a Russia-only bill. It has now since become global. Um, but it's a way to hold human rights uh, abusers to account. The one thing I, the reason why I, like, I can't let El Salvador go, because I spent so much time there, is because um, I, I, I knew too many people who were killed and who were disappeared. And, 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 and I think if people who commit these atrocities get away with it, then what's the lesson? The lesson I can get away with it again, and again, and again, and again. There has to be a consequence, and in a perfect world, the, the, the consequence for Sergei Magnitsky ought to be in Russia. The consequence for the people who killed the priests and those who massacred El Mazote ought to be in El Salvador. But if not there, there ought to be some international response to this. Um, now, the Magnitsky Act became law. It is Putin's number one issue that he wants repealed. 
And that is the whole basis for this interaction with the Trump uh, campaign about um, providing um, negative information on Hillary Clinton and other stuff, basically to try to get a deal with the Russians uh, that if Trump became president, he would repeal uh, the Magnitsky Act. Now, I think what Trump didn't realize is that to repeal the bill, you need to have Congress go along with you. Uh, and, uh, and the deal is we have bipartisan support in both the House and Senate on the Magnitsky Act. Uh, but it has been a powerful tool. It has annoyed Putin, uh, and it is now going to annoy some other human rights violators around the world uh, to no end. But it's the right thing to do. I mean, look, I mean, as I said before, we're not perfect in this country, you know, but in my, you know, in my kind of ideal vision of what the United States should be about, we ought to stand out loud and four square for human rights. Mm -hmm. I mean, that ought to be a fundamental principle of our foreign policy. Um, and um, to the extent we could move us in that direction, that's the right thing to do. And so I'm, I'm proud of the Magnitsky Act, and I didn't realize it was that could get all this attention. Um, I, I, I do now know I can never, there are two countries that have banned me now. Um, I cannot travel to Russia and I cannot travel to the Philippines. President Duterte announced that um, when I criticized uh, Trump's invitation to him coming to the White House. He said I'm no longer welcome in the Philippines. So, against aiding and abetting torture. I don't see why we couldn't have a law that said, for instance, every pilot who gets a pilot's license says, I will not knowingly fly a plane that is aiding and abetting torture. Right. Uh, and there are many other people, many people in the middle here. We see so many laws, I'm subject to them too, because I do IRBs, mm -hmm. deal with human subjects. <clears throat> Federal laws are going into the details of how I do my research, but, how about constraints on people who aid and abet torture? And here's another one most people don't think about. <coughs> torture flights involve picking people off airplanes and deciding who's going to be sent to Egypt to get tortured. To do that, you have to have computer program. Computer programmers who knowingly are creating uh, um, programs that are built to identify subgroups of people for purposes of torture, I think are also aiding and abetting. And this is something that affects the intellectual communities, including this one. But my question is, couldn't we have legislation of exactly that kind with respect to torture? We could, um, providing that, uh, you know, I mean, it, that's assuming that the pilots who are flying the planes actually know what, who, what, what their, their cargo is, is, is destined for. They can ask. Yeah, they, they can. I mean, and, you know, I, look, I, I agree. Um, we need to, we need to, one of the things we need to do is, make the law so clear that there is nobody who can give a Justice Department opinion that says that somehow, you know, rendition or torture or any of that stuff could possibly be legal. That you will go to jail if you are part, a part of that. Um, now, the reality is, who we got in Congress right now and who's in, who's in the White House? And I think in the short term, you know, what we need to do is any hint that this is going on right now, it needs to be exposed. We need to be supporting uh, journalists who are aggressive and trying to uh, hunt down these stories. We need to support whistleblowers, um, you know, uh, in our military, in our intelligence agencies who come forward and say that this is this is going on um, as we speak, um, and, and and help try to expose this. Um, you know, John McCain. Um, you know, I, I heard him give a speech one time with a very forceful speech against torture, and he himself was tortured. Uh, when he was a prisoner of war, but said that when you read the Army Manual, it is very clear that this is unacceptable, and that you know the torture is not um, is not something that we should ever embrace. Um, I mean, we learned a lot from the Bush years um, about the multiple people that were aiding um, in some of these torture techniques, including you know psychiatrists and. You know, people in the medical community who are helping administer some of this stuff and trying to justify it. I think, you know, the lesson here ought to be what you just said. It, I will do anything you want me to do, but I'm not going to take part in anything that 
resembles or constitutes torture. That is something. But I think we got to figure out how we how we tighten up these laws. But the knowing the reality right now is we're going to be limited what we can get passed in Congress. I think that the, the, the what we need to be right now is very very vigilant. Thank you. Uh, do you have any advice for local communities that are applying for grants through the, through the Department of Justice uh, when the grants are requiring commitments to become force multipliers uh, for things like cooperating with uh, immigration and customs enforcement? Uh, obviously, we as a community have decided that we will not do that and we cannot do that. Uh, but there are other communities that are looking at that and trying to figure out what to do uh, when it comes to getting federal funding for programs uh, and to make sure that, that students, that uh, young people that are able to take advantage of that federal funding uh, are able to continue to receive that. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement have uh, set up processes by which the Department of Justice can limit uh, the funding that uh, local communities receive. Uh, would you have any advice on how local communities might react to that? Yeah, one is I hope that somebody will bring the administration to court uh, over that. Um, because I, Congress could pass a law uh, that says that this community can't get money or this person can't get money. Um, but I, it, it's unclear to me, um, you know, especially uh, if we were talking about sanctuary, for example, sanctuary cities, you know, um, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I'd like to have this kind of tested in, in court. But look, um, we don't know how rigorously this administration is going to enforce these things because, you know, uh, we're not just talking about places like Amherst. We're talking about places like New York City. We're talking about places like Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. I mean, whatever. And, you know, um, basically what they're saying is because we don't like the fact um, that um, you, you've done something that uh, we object to, we're going to punish you, and we're going to punish your law enforcement in particular, and not provide you uh, necessary police funding, for example. Well, that just doesn't make any, any, any sense to me. The whole, uh, you know, I, I mean, what I've heard from law enforcement is that one of the reasons why they have absolutely no problem, and many of them support, uh, these agreements about, um, you know, uh, not becoming ICE agents, essentially, is because they know if you want to protect the security of the community, you need everybody to feel comfortable coming forward. So if I'm an undocumented immigrant from Guatemala or El Salvador or Honduras, and I see a crime, you know, I want to report that, but, uh, you know, I may, maybe I have to think twice to report it. If I know if I report it, I will be subject to de deportation and separated from my family. Issues of domestic violence. I want anybody who's a victim of domestic violence, uh, no matter what their status is, to feel comfortable coming forward. We want to protect people. Uh, but we know that in many of our communities, even here in Massachusetts, a lot of our, of our uh, members of our immigrant community feel that they can't come forward. They feel that they will endanger their entire family if they do. Um, we are... Uh, we, I guess my, my, my only advice to you is, is that if you, if you apply for any kind of Homeland Security grant um, in the short term, please coordinate with our office, and we will also coordinate with our two senators um, and to try to make the case, uh, you know, to try to get around some of this stuff if we can. Um, but again, I, uh, we have an attorney general right now who... Uh, is worse than I thought he would be. Um, I mean, we're not only dealing with, quite frankly, we're not only, it's not only an issue with regard to sanctuary cities, it's, an, it's also an issue with regard to our marijuana laws, too. It's unclear how um, he, you know, he's got a kind of some tough talk, what it means in reality, I, I don't know. Thank you. So let, let me just, let me just close. Do you have any other questions? Are we help? No, I'm just going to ask if we need to or this, or this, we got to, okay, are we okay? We're okay, we're okay. There's a couple of... No mic is needed. I can project very, very well. Okay. Even now, so Hadley can hear me. Uh, and TV can hear me too. Um, <laughs> so my question is, on the home front, right. um, you mentioned about food security. 
And I'm talking about uh, another human right is housing. And there's a severe housing crisis in Amherst and around the country. You can't cook any food if you don't have a kitchen to cook it in. Right. So with, it kind of comes along together. Um, we're several vouchers short, especially in Amherst. Um, we had a thing with presidential apartments that, that reneged on affordable housing. And so much so, they left people um, without housing. It was supposed to be September. It's been followed in the Gazette. September 1st deadline for affordable housing. Move in September 1st. And they reneged on a deal. Caymans is doing it. And he's on vacation right now, knowing that people are without housing because of him. Um, he's the management company that's representing Cone, who owns presidential apartments. And so that's the uh, crux of the matter. There's lack of handicapped accessible housing in Amherst and around the country. It's very short supply. We are aging as a country. We need more accessible housing. Um, and every single housing authority I've ever met, they're all corrupt. It's in the corruption that because there no, there's no, um, how to put it diplomatically, there is no accountability. Um, for the executive directors of a housing authority. They limit people, they exclude people, try to get them off the list by exclusion, by address alone. They, they try to get people out of, their, out of their projects and stuff with false excuses. It's really, really terrible. They're, they're, the reason why they were in charge in the first place, their number one mission statement is to provide housing for seniors and disabled. And they're not doing it. So they're doing everything but. And they're getting millions and millions of dollars, and they're falling short. Yeah. Well, look, so how I, can we address well, that? Well, one is, some of it is going to have to be done here locally. I mean, every, every housing authority, um, you know, has a, has a local component to it. And I'm not an expert on all the stuff in the Amherst Housing Authority. But I can tell you this, that one of the challenges that housing authorities face, um, you know, is that uh, there's not the resources, they're not being provided the resources to be able to provide the housing necessary for all those who need it. When I live in Worcester, the, I mean, the, the, the waiting list in Worcester is years. Um, and, you know, uh, that's a little comfort to somebody who needs housing right now. Um, there is less and less willingness on the federal level to provide the federal funds for the vouchers and for, and for building new housing. Um, and, um, and so it's, it, it is a, so some, some fundamentals have to change in this country. I mean, if, if we want to end food security, if we want to end food insecurity, if we want to deal with the housing crisis that is not just unique here, it's all over the country, um, uh, if we want to help people transition to jobs uh, who are looking to, to get to work, we need to provide the funding. Um, and instead, we nickel and dime these budgets time and time again. You have housing authorities that get federal money, but they have housing stocks that are so old they need to be rebuilt. They need roofs. They need this. They need that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a state responsibility here. There's a federal responsibility. And, you know, and we're, you know, on, on, a, on individual issues, if it's here with the Amherst Housing Authority or anybody else, call Keith Barnacle in my Northampton office, and we will we will try to work with you. But I'm I'm, I'm not given a, a you know a, a free ride to housing authorities. But I I do I mean they they there are these huge waiting lists. People need housing. Um, and there's none available, uh, and um, and we need affordable housing for people, and that requires a match by the government. That means we need to talk about expanding some of these programs, uh, you know, not not contracting them. And so, uh, but on individual cases, call Keith. And uh, but I, I I agree with you. Housing is a is a, is a fundamental human right. Food is a fundamental human right. Health care is a fundamental human right. Um, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, those things we, you know, I mean, we, 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 we had an election. It didn't turn out quite the way I'd hoped. And we're, we're now battling to hold on to the scraps we have, which is frustrating as hell. Um, when we ought to be talking about expanding some of this investment. So Keith, Keith works? In the Northampton office. Right. Yeah. Just speaking about the election process, do you have faith that there are enough safeguards in place currently so that the upcoming election cycle uh, will be fair and unbiased. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, I worry about this all the time because um, 
We are electing secretaries of states in various states across this country who are trying to find ways to suppress votes, vote, voter participation. Um, you know, we have state legislatures in some of our states that are trying to pass laws to suppress voter participation. Um, you know, um, we have, you know, cases where on election days that the only place where the polls are open are in areas, you know, that uh, Republicans like. Um, <laughs> and it makes it more difficult for people uh, who live outside those neighborhoods to get there. Or trying to limit the hours uh, when people can vote uh, so that working people can't vote. I mean, all that really bothers me. On top of all of that, um, the president's, you know, uh, scam of an, uh, this election fraud commission in which he alleges that uh, he would have won the popular vote if it weren't for all the undocumented immigrants that voted for Hillary Clinton. I mean, just ridiculous stuff. I mean, it all, it all bothers me, not because I think there's any substance there, but because he's contributing to this impression that, uh, you know, amongst a certain group of people in this country, um, you know, that uh, the reality is something very, very different. Um, and I worry that that makes state legislators vulnerable to passing laws that, are, that, re that restrict people's rights to vote. I'm also really worried about, you know, I mean, as we learn more and more about this Russia involvement in our election, I mean, i I got to be honest with you, I mean, um, you know, you know, people say it's, it's, it's just about John Podesta's emails. No, that's the least of it. I mean, it's this elaborate attempt to use social media to get you to, you know, uh, either stay home, you know, or to think something that isn't true. I mean, they were, they were very, very clever. I mean, they were, you know, I mean, they, you know, they were, they were manipulating Democratic voters against one another after the, uh, the, the convention. They were pitting, uh, uh, creating tension between the African-American community and the Muslim community. I mean, all of this stuff it should be deeply, deeply troubling. And um, uh, that's a long way of saying I am not convinced that all the safeguards that need to be in place are in place. And it's hard to feel comfortable when we have an administration that wants to make believe nothing happened, that everything is perfect, that there's no voter suppression, that there's no nothing, um, and and we all know that that's not the case. Um, and um, you know, I, I'm willing to bet that a big part of what you're going to hear about in this Alabama election is going to be uh, the number of votes that were discouraged from turning out. Don't be surprised if there's a robocall. The election is tomorrow, right? Uh, tomorrow, saying don't forget, don't forget to vote on Wednesday. <laughs> I mean, that is that happens. Um, so the, integ the, the integrity of our elections, the protection of voter voting rights is is incredibly important. And I, I got to tell you, I mean, you know, I, if you were to ask me ten years ago whether I thought in or even a few years ago in 2017 that one of the major challenges in our country is protecting voting rights, I mean, I, I mean, I, you like to think that we're making progress, and we have in some cases, but now we've just we've gone backwards. And, um, and I've come to appreciate the power of secretaries of states, you know, not the sexiest, most um, talked about office uh, in states, but very, very important. Early voting laws, you know, uh, where polls are going to be open, how are you going to vote, all that kind of stuff. Hours of voting, all that stuff matters. So, um, and, um, and we live in a progressive state here, but we can't take any granted here either. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's worth paying attention to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know that on a, a bigger scale, that gerrymandering is also an issue that comes through. Right. Yeah, here we go. Um, this is, I think this should be the last, All right, the last, the last question. Um, I know that on a, a bigger scale, gerrymandering is also like a huge issue when it comes to voting. Um, and that the prison system is, right. is also an issue when it comes to suppressing voters. Um, is there any movement or any action to help uh, get rid of gerrymandering as, as a legal practice that happens? Yeah. So here's the deal. Um, you know, congressional districts are drawn by state legislatures by and large. And, and let me just say to everybody here, I love my congressional district, right? <laughs> I, 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 you know, it's just great. But, but here's what I also believe. 
there needs to be some integrity to how you draw these lines. I think the Massachusetts legislature did a good job. They had bipartisan support for their redistricting plan. That has not always been the case in our history. But let's solve this problem. And the way you solve it is you say, let's have independent commissions draw these districts. Let's take it out of, out of politics so that nobody questions whether this was a, you know, you know, if the Republicans are in control, they get to draw it. The Democrats are in control, they get, they get to do it. Let's just do this the right way. You know, when I first ran for office, my district, they called it the Ivy League district. It went from Princeton, Massachusetts to Dartmouth, Massachusetts. It's this little snake that went, you know, from Worcester to the Alabama to Fall River to, to Dartmouth. I want it. I want it, and I would, so I love. I loved it, but um, but it was drawn specifically to disadvantage um, a, a, a Democratic incumbent who and, uh, who lost that seat uh, to a Republican, and. Um, and you know, and I, and again, I, I I learned a lot. I loved everybody I met with. But if you looked at a map, you had, you'd be saying to yourself like, "What were? They, maybe there was a you know, maybe people had a lot to drink before they put this together because it just didn't didn't you know make a lot of sense geographically." Um, the districts now do here in Massachusetts, but the district I used to have is not dissimilar from a lot of districts in this country where districts are drawn so narrowly that it's not just a Republican district, it's a right, right wing Republican district. And I'm just going to say this, I, I, you know, I mean, uh, Joe mentioned, I, people I said I'm one of the most liberal members of Congress, that's who I am, I'm proud of that. But here's what I also believe, you know, that if, if, if I go to work every day and say it's my way or the highway, nothing will ever happen. I, I may not be able to get 100% of what I want, but if I can move the ball forward 20, 30, 40, you know, yards, hey, I'm going to do it. And then I'll fight next year to do it even more. I mean, you, want, you don't want to give up your principles, but you want to move the ball forward. We are electing people to Congress who run on the, on the, on the, on the platform of no compromise, never compromise. Well, you know what? We can't even all agree on what to have for lunch. I mean, sometimes you've got to give and take. And sometimes I'll get a little bit more, but sometimes you'll get a little bit more. But the bottom line is, as long as I feel my values are moving forward, you know, I'm willing to go along with that. You don't do that. And we're rewarding people for bad behavior. When Congressman Joe Wilson stood up and screamed at President Obama, you lie, which I, 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 I was shocked. You know what? He got rewarded. He raised a boatload of money online that night. That has to stop. And I think one of the ways to stop it is to fix this redistricting stuff once and for all, all across the country. And let me just close with saying to everybody this. You know, um, one, thank you for doing this today. Thank you for turning out on a, on a Sunday. Thank you for all of your advocacy. But um, human, uh, human rights uh, are, are incredibly, are, is an incredibly important topic that sometimes gets shortchanged. You know, I, like I said, I, when I was in El Salvador, I, I had a guy, a reporter asked me, because he read one of the comments online on an article, and said, what am I, somebody in my district, what the, what the hell does a Massachusetts congressman care about what happened in El, El Salvador in, in a place called El Mazote? And he asked me that question in front of the community of survivors at El Mazote. And I said, and, th and this is the reason why is because, you know, one, as I was raised to believe that everybody is important, you know, and that, you know, I ought to care about the person who lives halfway down the block, and I ought to care about the person who lives halfway around the world. Everybody is important. You know, I don't know what it was about, you know, why, why fate had it that I was born here, but I'm allowed to say what I want, and so far I'm not get arrested uh, for <laughs> saying what I, what I, what I believe. Uh, but that's not the case all over the world. And when I was in El Salvador in the early 1980s as a young congressional staffer, I mean, I, I saw the impact that our government had on funding that military. And I, as a young 23-year-old staffer, was horrified that our country, in any way, shape, or form, would support a government, a military, that killed archbishop, that raped and killed nuns, killed priests, killed academics and students and unionists. And I just, that's just, 
That is not what I think of when I want to think of the United States of America. And I know we haven't had a perfect past, but I'm clinging to the ideal that we need to do better. Um, and that's why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is so important. And that's why it ought to mean more. And that's why we need leaders in the White House and Congress in local communities to stand up for human rights. And that's why I'm proud of Amherst for becoming a sanctuary city. And that's why I'm proud of so many other communities that are talking about human rights on this day. This is important. It's about who we are. And I, and I, think, we're, I think we're a lot better than what's on display in Washington right now. And I'm counting on you to help increase the pressure uh, so that we can live up to the ideals that we all know we should be living up to. So thank you for having me here today.